All right, so next up we have Keegan Boyle, who will be telling us about involutions on the four ball and strongly negative amphichiral knots. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the invitation to speak and organizing this. Um, I'm going to tell you about something I'm really excited about instead of something more group theoretic, so bear with me, but hopefully it should be understandable and uh, I should be able to answer any questions, so don't hesitate to ask. Um, so this talk is is basically a, a discussion of how we can study the homeomorphism group of, well, maybe not SN in general, but maybe of the four sphere. Um, I guess uh, if we're a geometric group theorist, or if I'm a geometric group theorist, my first thought of studying a homeomorphism group is to like mod out by isotopy and just think about the mapping class group. Um, for this particular group, that's not going to be very interesting because, of course, for spheres, all homeomorphisms of the same degree are isotopic. So uh, you're just going to get Z mod 2, uh, or, or just the trivial group if you only consider orientation preserving homeomorphisms. Um, so we really need, you know, if we want to study this group, we really need more information than what's in the mapping class group. Um, we can't mod out by isotopy entirely. Uh, so instead, I I guess a natural place to start is by thinking about some finite order elements um, and maybe consider them up to conjugation in the homeomorphism group instead of up to isotopy. Um, in this talk, we'll just consider involution, so order two elements, and maybe just n equals three and four. Um, yeah, I think higher dimensional things we don't know enough about, and maybe lower dimensional things we know everything about. Not quite, but yeah. Okay, so. Uh, well, let's start by thinking about S3. So if uh, I have, uh, I guess I'll use the words locally linear, but basically I want an involution that's not too terrible. Um, uh, so if I have an involution on a sphere, the fixed set has the homology of a sphere. Uh, I guess Smith proved this by long time ago by looking at homology before it was called homology. Now we have some fancy spectral sequence proof of this fact. Um, so if we think about the cases then, if I have the three sphere, the fixed point set can be empty. Indeed, there's one of those, the antipodal involution. Uh, it could be an S0. Uh, indeed, there's one of those, which is point reflection. If you think about that in R3, it's like the map X goes to minus X. Um, the fixed point set could be a, a one-dimensional sphere. This is a really famous problem in low dimensions, the um, Smith conjecture, like to prove that only the unknot can be the fixed set of a group action here. Um, and so, but there is one of those, rotation around the unknot. Um, or the fix that could be an S2, in which case we could have reflection across that S2. Um, uh, just as a remark here, I'll mention that, of course, these also determine the possible involutions on knots in the three sphere, since an involution on a knot should be an involution on S3 that leaves the knot invariant. Um, and I think the next thing you might ask is, are there any more involutions besides just those four? So here I, I gave an example of an involution which each, each of these possible four fixed sets, the empty sphere, the zero sphere, the one sphere, the two sphere. Uh, and you might ask, is there some other involution, say that has a fixed set S1, that was the Smith conjecture, like maybe there's a fixed set, some other knot besides the unknot. Um, and here's a theorem that combines the work of just like everybody ever. Uh, so basically each of these people contributed to a different case here, and I think more people contributed to some of the cases than I've listed, so I, I don't have a complete list, but the result is a theorem that says that every nice enough involution on the three sphere is conjugate in the homeomorphism group to an isometry, uh, like an involution in the orthogonal group. Um, this is really nice because it tells us like geometry is all we need to think about in three dimensions. Uh, we don't have to worry about topological things that aren't geometric. I guess that's kind of Perlman's whole thing is like you can geometrize three manifolds. Um, and now we can just study O4, which is matrices, which I think is a little bit easier than looking at spaces. Uh, and we can see, yeah, there's only these four conjugacy classes of involutions. Um, Great, so we sort of have a complete answer of what involutions are possible on the three sphere up to this uh, you know, sort of weaker equivalence relation or stronger equivalence relation than isotopy of conjugation. Um, now, of course, I want to move on to the next dimension and think about dimension four. So 
frame dilutions on S4, a lot, a lot less is known. Um, but let me tell you what is known. So in 1974, Cameron Gordon, who was sort of building on work of Giffen, uh, constructed involutions with fixed sets, which are S2. But those S2s are not just like the trivial unknotted S2. There, there's some knotted two sphere in S4. That's a co-dimension two embedding. So this could be a knotted sphere, and there are ones. And Gordon give examples of these where they're knotted. Um, the result is that these involutions cannot be conjugate to an isometry in the orthogonal group because uh, the elements of the orthogonal group have unknotted fixed sets only. So just like in S3, you're going to have these same examples where you have a fixed empty set S0, S1, S2, or S3. Um, but now here we have examples, and in fact, this is infinitely many examples of involutions that are not conjugate to an isometry. So the sort of world of involutions blows up when we go from dimension three to dimension four. In dimension three, we have exactly four involutions. We just list them out here. And in dimension four, now we have infinitely many. Uh, OK, so we have something to study here. Um, I think there's a good question of thinking about some sort of classification of these guys. But that's actually not what I want to talk about. Instead, I want to talk about the case where the fixed set is S0 or S1. And I want to ask this same question. If I have an involution on the four sphere, its fixed point set now is S0 or S1 instead of S2, I want to ask if the involution must be conjugate to an isometry. Um, this is like not obvious. Well, I'll get to that in the next slide, actually. I also want to mention that if we think about restricting this to like half of the four sphere, just the four ball, or remove one of the fixed points, then this is related to asking a question if there's an involution on the four ball, which has a fixed point set, which is just one point or a single arc. Uh, so it's like S0 minus a point or an S1 minus a point. Um, and again, you can ask, must this involution be conjugate to an isometry? OK, so why is this harder than this S2 case? Well, in the case where you had a fixed S2, you could distinguish the isometry uh, by the not type of the fixed point set. Um, so that was like topological information that we could just get our hands on and then like compute some generalized not invariant for. Um, but if you have a fixed set, which is S0 or S1, now the there's a unique embedding of those lower dimensional spheres. They're more than co-dimension two, so you can wiggle them around as much as you want. There's a unique embedding of S0 and S1. So there's not going to be topological information about the fixed set that distinguishes these different embeddings or it, it, that distinguishes these different involutions. Um, like the embeddings of their fixed point sets are going to be actually identical. So somehow we need some new information to try and distinguish these. Um, indeed, that's my conjecture for you, is that I think that there should be involutions that are not conjugate to any isometry. Um, but it's not clear how to tell them apart, or even how to construct them. So the idea is, well, we've gotten pretty good at studying knots. We have a lot of knot invariants. They tell us a lot of things. So I'm going to try and reformulate this problem by describing a question about knots, and then hopefully we can say something. So first, we need a couple of definitions. So uh, a knot in the three sphere, so now this is an S1 and S3, I'm going to call that slice if it bounds a disk in the four ball. And then, OK, I need to say some words here to make sure that that disk doesn't have any terrible points in it. Uh, the, the correct thing to say turns out to be topologically locally flat. That doesn't really matter. You just imagine it bounds a disk without any like weird cone points on it. Um, it's called slice because if you have a knot, you could imagine like if you have a loaf of bread and you slice it, then your slice of bread, the like crust is a knot, like the unknot, and then the middle part of the bread is the slice. So if you slice the four ball, maybe with like a knot shaped knife, then the middle part will be the slice disc and the boundary will be the knot. Um, okay, so that's the idea. Um, and now I was wanting to think about symmetries. So I want some notion of a symmetrically sliced knot. So um, now, if I have some knot with, in this talk, just an involution on it, this definition is a little more general, um, I'm going to call it equivariantly slice if there's a slice disk which is invariant under some symmetry that restricts to that symmetry on S3. 
In order for this to be necessary, I need, for example, to know that there is some extension of my symmetry. Um, but somehow, you know, in this definition, I'm allowing it to be any symmetry, any symmetry which restricts to the right one on S3. Okay, so it's some sort of symmetric slice disk, um, and it might be a weird symmetry. On the other hand, I could ask for that slice disk, the symmetric slice disk, to be invariant under my favorite particular symmetry, which would be like an isometry. Okay. So I'm going to call it standardly equivariantly sliced if it has a slice disk, which is symmetric under an isometry on the four ball that restricts to this symmetry on S3. Now, of course, I know my symmetry on S3 is an isometry. Every involution on S3 is an isometry. But I'm, you know, what I'm thinking about is that there might be weird symmetries on the four ball. So um, this is that. You know, two different definitions that might be the same if every involution is conjugate to an isometry. Okay, so it could be these are the same definition, but not obviously. There's a lot of text on this slide, so I'm, and I've been talking quickly. I'll just pause for a second. And we'll, we'll give some examples in a second as well. Um, so now that we have these ideas, the, the main idea is we want to find a symmetric knot, which is equivariantly sliced. That means that there's a slice disk with respect to some symmetry on the four ball, but not standardly equivariantly sliced, so that there's no slice disk if I insist that it's the I like if the I insist that the symmetry is an isometry. Um, and if we find a knot like that then that means that, that these notions are really different, of course. And hence, there must be an involution on the four ball, which is not conjugate to an isometry. Um, this, if you're worried about like this conjugating action, well, if I have a slice disk with respect to some symmetry and I apply a conjugation, then the image of that disk under that conjugation is still going to be a slice disk. Um, Okay, so let's take a closer look at one particular case so we can give some examples. Um, I want to think about when the fixed point set of the involution is an S0 in S3, so two points in S3, and an arc in the four ball. Um, so you can think about this as point reflection. If you, I can't think about S3, so I can only think about R3. So I'm going to throw away one of the fixed points, put it at infinity, and then I'm thinking on R3, I have point reflection across the origin, and then when I extend that to B4, or like I guess it'll be a half plane if I'm thinking about R3, then that's like a fixed ray. Um, okay. Uh, now I want to think about knots. So there's actually two cases here. Um, this fixed S0 in S3, it could be that it's disjoint from the knot, so that the two fixed points, you know, are away from the knot. Um, and then we call this kind of knot a strongly positive amphichiral knot. There's some terrible knot theoretic historic, historical reason for this name. Basically, you can ignore that. Um, maybe it's useful to think that amphichiral means that the thing is the same as its mirror. This is an orientation reversing involution. So that's why there's like a sort of amphichiral symmetry coming in. Um, yeah, don't worry about those other words. Uh, that's actually not what I want to talk about, though. What I want to talk about is when the two fixed points lie on the knot. Then we call the knot strongly negative amphichiral. This negative is because now it's like the orientation on the knot got reversed because there was a fixed point on the knot. Um, so let's give an example. So here is a what I'm going to tell you is standardly equivariantly sliced. So this is a strongly negative amphichiral knot. Um, you can kind of see that this picture is symmetric, but let me point out that it's not quite symmetric in exactly the way you think. It looks like you just rotate it around and it's the same diagram. But actually, if I rotate it around, this sort of um, strands that go over become strands that go under. So I have to compose a 180 degree rotation with a reflection across the plane of the diagram. So that'll be this orientation reversing symmetry. You could equivalently think about it as point reflection across the point in the middle of the diagram. Um, and I said there should be two fixed points on the knot. So one of them is at the middle of this diagram, and the other one is at infinity.
I also claimed that this knot was standardly equivariantly sliced. So I'm going to show you how to see that real quickly. Um, what we can do is attach a pair of bands. I've drawn that these tiny bands in the with their edges in red here. Um, if I attach these two little bands to this knot, you can hopefully convince yourself that now you can sort of unhook it from itself and you'll get a three component like unlink. So three completely separate components. Um, and if I have an unlink, then I can, I have one fixed component that bounds an equivariant slice disk. And then I have the other two components that just bound a pair of disks that get exchanged. And then when I glue these two bands back in, I see that I have a uh, equivariant slice disk for this knot. Um, this is standard because, um, well, I can do this with respect to the standard symmetry. Um, yeah, and the standard symmetry here is this like, you could think of it as, if I think of the four ball as a bunch of slices of S3, it's just the same symmetry on each S3. So when I push things into the four ball a little bit, I just do the same symmetry. Um, okay, so we have two goals here now. One is we want to construct a strongly negative amphichiral knot, which is equivariantly sliced. And we need to do that in some way so that it's not obviously standardly equivariantly sliced. So this way I just described how to show, see that this knot was equivariantly sliced. This is obviously standardly equivariantly sliced. So I need some weirder way to do this. And then the second thing is I need an obstruction that tells me if I have an equivariantly sliced knot, I need to be able to obstruct it being standardly equivariantly sliced. Okay, and I have some ideas for doing both of these things. That's what we're going to get to next. Um, so for the first problem, uh, my collaborator Wen Jiao Chen and I have proved the following theorem. So uh, if for any strongly negative amphichiral knot, if it has a trivial Alexander polynomial, then it is equivariantly sliced. Um, if you don't know what the Alexander polynomial is, that's fine. What's important here is that this is something that's really easy to compute from a knot diagram. So this is a way to check, and we have many, many examples of these kinds of knots, which are now equivariantly sliced. Um, and furthermore, in this construction, the equivariant slice disks that we construct, they are not obviously conjugate to an isometry. They do not obviously use the standard symmetry. Um, these are probably, we think, some weird involution. Okay, so this is kind of a, a nice answer to part one here of constructing interesting equivariantly sliced knots. Um, let me just give you one example. So here's a strongly negative amphichiral knot with a trivial Alexander polynomial. It's kind of annoying because a lot of the existing knot software, you know, it doesn't have the symmetry stuff built in. So I can put this into existing software and check that it's strongly negative amphichiral and that it has trivial Alexander polynomial, but I can't get it to draw it for me symmetrically. So I actually don't know how to do that, but you just have to believe me that the computer checks for you that this knot does have some symmetry, even though it can't show it to you. <laughs> um, great. I have a couple of minutes left, maybe. So let me very briefly say something about the proof of this theorem. Um, so I was going to use surgery theory, pin minus cobordism, and Friedman's disk embedding theorem. Those are the main ingredients. And I've got sort of a one sentence description of the proof here. So we're going to take the knot exterior, so that's S3 minus the knot. Because the two fixed points were on the knot, I now have a free symmetry on the exterior. So I can take its quotient. That'll be some three manifold with like torus boundary. I'm going to check that it bounds some four manifold. Then I'm going to perform surgery to kill any unexpected homotopy group elements. Then I can take the double cover back up to my knot exterior in S3, and I can attach a two handle and I'll have my slice disk complement. And because I did everything in the quotient, and only at the very end did I take the double cover back to the original thing, I'm going to have my symmetry still there. So this is constructing some symmetric slice disk complement. Um, these surgeries, it's like a bit mysterious how surgery theory works, but it's constructing some weird four manifolds. And so we don't expect that the double cover will be the standard symmetry. We expect that we get back some weird symmetry on the floor ball when we do this construction. Um, okay, great. So now for step two here, where we wanted to obstruct that this was actually standardly equivariantly sliced. Uh, we don't know exactly how to do that, but here's our idea that we are working on now. 
Um, we want to take an equivariant analog of basically existing things that obstruct not sliceness. Um, so if you know what I'm talking about, there's Rasmussen's S invariant coming from Kavanaugh homology or the tau invariant from not floor homology. Um, and these things are uh, slice obstructions for knots. And the way that you prove that they're slice obstructions um, is via a sequence of diagrammatic moves that I think only makes sense if your involution is an isometry. So if we want to do this equivariantly, we're just going to try and reproduce S and tau, S or tau. And when we use the proof, when we try and recreate the proof, it's going to involve doing a sequence of diagrammatic moves that only makes sense for an isometry. So it seems like at least this proof will only work for the standard symmetry or an isometry. So we don't see any reason why these things um, have to vanish for equivariantly sliced knots. It seems like they only have to vanish for standardly equivariantly sliced knots. So we hopefully can compute one of, you know, define one of these things and then compute it on one of our Alexander polynomial one examples. And then we'll have a new, uh, new symmetry on the floor ball. Um, so specifically, we would have a new involution on the floor ball with a fixed point set in arc, and it would not be conjugate to any isometry. Um, of course, I was talking about S4 at the beginning, so I want to bring us back to there. If I glued two of these involutions together, um, then we would get an involution on S4, and hopefully we could check that if we didn't have an isometry on the floor ball, then we still didn't have an isometry on the floor ball. So this is sort of a, a long... <laughs> uh, project, but that's the idea. Um, thanks. Let's thank the speaker. Any questions? OK, so I have. I have one question. Um, so, in the in in the uh, theorem that you have for for step one, um, what what is this Alexander polynomial, and and how does it appear in the proof? Yeah. So the Alexander polynomial uh, is some homology information about the sort of infinite cyclic cover of the knot. Um, yeah. If the if you take the, well, the not complement, it has first homology Z. So you can take an infinite cyclic cover coming from the um, that map on homology. Mm -hmm. And then you try and keep careful track of the homology of the infinite cyclic cover. It turns out it has some module structure over a Laurent polynomial ring. So this Alexander polynomial is some Laurent polynomial. Um, and the way it comes up in the theorem is when you're trying to do this surgery, um, there's this whole surgery theory, which has existed for like 50 or like longer than 50 years now, like 70 years. It's really complicated. But what it comes down to is if you know certain homological information about your homotopy group elements, then you can perform surgery to kill them. So basically, in order to do these surgeries, you need some homological information, and that turns out to come exactly from the opposite. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Any other questions for the speaker? All right, if no, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>